and this was a fascinating uh, lesson for me having, mm. I'd been on the franchise or side for a long time um, at this point, And it had been a while since I'd been on the franchisee side. And for about a year, I actually, I spent some time with Cecil. Then I actually went out to LA and helped another fr enhanced franchise owner grow his business. And what I realized is even me knowing that I need, we needed the support from the, from the franchise or we would forget to think about them. You're so focused on the customers and you're so focused on your business as a franchise owner. Uh, you often don't turn, you know, I think about it. You, you, you don't think about asking for the support because you're an entrepreneur, right? Right. And what the lesson I walked away with uh, and I took into the rest of my franchising career was how we have to we have to smooth we have to be very proactive as the franchisor to make sure that we're helping to provide that support, not waiting for them to ask for help. Welcome to the Small Business Safari, where I help guide you to avoid those traps, pitfalls, and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent to that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from hitting your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, adventure team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. Welcome back, everybody, to the Small Business Safari. We're going to help you get up that mountaintop of success. And today, we're going to get into it with Tara Riley, who's the franchise president for Fresh Coat Painters. She's got over 35 years' experience, all wide and varied, everything from McDonald's on down to sports clips. And Hans Wood can't wait to get into all that. Uh, what we love is that she actually started in Minnesota, but actually went down to Texas A&M to go to school and then ended up in our great state of Georgia to go to Kennesaw State. But the thing that drew my attention the most was in her free time, not only does she like to volunteer for the St. Vincent de Paul, go Catholics, I love cooking, golfing, touring back roads on her motorcycle with her best friend and companion, Steve. <laughs> Welcome, Tara Riley. Cheers. 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 Tara. Well, thank so, you for having me. Well, we're excited to get into it. But before we do that, we just wondered, uh, your favorite companion, Steve, uh, did, does your husband know about this guy? I thought it, I thought it was your dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes yeah, you know we try to keep certain things in the background but, solid yeah. so. all right now i guess we can jump into it now that we've loosened her up a little bit so tara thanks for joining us so you grew up in minnesota but you said i'm out of here going to texas a&m or had you moved down there already no uh i graduated from high school i grew up right um we're actually in the uh, right on the north dakota minnesota border so i can claim both my dad was from there originally which is how we ended up up there. But uh, my mom was from Texas. And so I actually spent all my summers in Texas. And I didn't know that Texas had any other season than hot as heck growing up. I mean, I spent, if you think about this, I spent my winters in yeah. upper, like in North Dakota, Minnesota, where it's like 35 below. And I spent summers in Texas where, you know, it was kind of had that backwards. Yeah, you're like yeah. you're like the reverse snowbird. <laughs> yeah, when I actually when I went down to go to school, masochism. It is. I mean, when yeah. I went but down to go to school about October, I called my mom up and I'm like, "Hey, mom, we got to talk. You you forgot to tell me about this." You know, it's like I we should have. What 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 were we doing growing up in the in the tundra? Oh my goodness, that's but, awesome. And now you've split the difference, and you're in Cincinnati. Ex yeah, you know, after when I when I graduated from high school and moved to Texas, I promised myself I was not moving back to to winter. And for th over thirty years, the farthest north I lived was Kennesaw. And uh, then this opportunity came up with Fresh Coat, and I it required me to move to Cincinnati. And I thought, ah, it wouldn't be that bad, uh, you know. And, and honestly, Cincinnati's winters are nothing compared to to the Great White <laughs> North. But no. but we. But the other day I had a PTSD flashback because I went to bed. It was 44 degrees and raining, woke up. It was eight degrees below zero. We had five <laughs> inches of snow on the ground and there were 31 degree below zero wind chill. And I'm like, did I get transported back to North Dakota or you start clicking your heels to go back home? Yeah. Take me yeah away. I was like, Oh, take me away. The um, polar vortex. That's awesome. So you went to Texas A&M knowing that one day you were going to be a painter. That's right. There you go. So you go to Texas A&M, boom. I guess you're not a painter, of course, but so you went to school to Texas A&M. What did you get your degree in? And then what did you do after that? 
So um, my degree from A&M eventually, um, which I took a, a little more elongated course in getting my degree, I think, than a lot of people, but it was in Didn't we in, all? in management, but uh, organizational development was my was my focus, which uh, led me into really a love of, I love um, scaling. I love, what does it take to build the organization that scales? So where I kind of landed from there, I worked my way through school. So I started working for McDonald's when I was in high school. Now, clearly, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, neither was a, a McDonald's professional nor a franchise professional rolling off my tongue at that time, uh, or painter even. Um, I, you know, I had more, probably a little more philanthropic aspirations. You know, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a veterinarian. And hence, Texas A&M was a good choice. Uh, you know, actually growing up, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, usually I would say something flippant, like, I don't know anything but business. And that go. is a true fact. I didn't, as a child, I didn't have any understanding. My parents were not entrepreneurs. Um, I, My mom was a teacher. My dad worked at a bank. I, I didn't have a good understanding of what business was all about uh, back then. So, you know, the idea of going into business, uh, either owning a business or supporting businesses was definitely not on my radar back then. But isn't that McDonald's experience really good? I mean, wow. you learn so much about process and time management and, and customer service, and it's just shoved down your throat. I, I had the same thing in high school in, in Burger King. Yeah. And I, Whoa, I, you guys are kindred spirits. Well, we're actually the, arch rivals. Arch oh, rivals. That's right. Okay. My first night was on drinks, and I just about had a meltdown. I couldn't keep up with the drinks. <laughs> Friday night rush. Now they just push a freaking button. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> you push it. I actually had to I put the ice in it and fill it to a certain level, and and that couldn't keep up. And the drive through girl was yelling at me. I mean, it was a rough first day. Listen, you're not going to die of thirst. I'll get this drink to you. <laughs> that's not what we do here at Burger King. That's not the Burger King way. I bet you that didn't happen to McDonald's, did it? Because there's so oh, much no. water. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No, there, I mean, I, I could, I spent almost 20 years with McDonald's. You can imagine I have a lot of disaster stories, um, a lot wow. of good stories too, but you know, you, you, Alan, you're right. It now, the, even now I look back on and realize how valuable all that experience was, especially, you know, from management learning to, you know, having to hire people, you know, I've probably hired over well over a thousand people in my lifetime and had to, you know, and working with people to get the best out of them, training, understanding how important training is in developing people. You know, nobody gets up in the morning going, I think I'm just going to suck today. <laughs> you know, really, they don't. I mean, but you know, a lot of I, people I, also don't get up and go, I'm going to do a great job today when they head, head to yeah. their off. Yeah, right, I can't. Right, yeah, Chris? Yeah, that, I, that hit you a little hard. Today. Yeah, that was yeah. good. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to suck today. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to put that over my thing. Instead of <laughs> be great today, I'm going to put just don't suck today. All right. just, but, <laughs> so you came out of Texas A&M, did, and you, you were working at McDonald's, and then you started working your way up in the chain? Is that what you did? Yeah. So while it, when I left to go to, to school at A&M, I kept working for McDonald's, even though, you know, like I said, that was just to make some money, to make sure I had, you know, I could, uh, you know, fill the car with gas and buy beer on weekends, whatever, you know. But uh, I, I also was raised with a value that said, whatever you do, do your best. Yeah. Right. You know, so don't su it's not just don't suck, but do your best. So, you know, I just felt like if you're going to do something, do your best. So I always, you know, I guess I always just tried to do my best. And, um, you know, lo and behold, I kept getting promoted. Um, it's funny you know? how well that works, doesn't it? You know, yeah. you show up with a good attitude and do a good job and good things tend to happen. Well, she obviously she had the, the seed planted early with the parents. You could tell, but you know, banker, school teacher, working in high school while she's still going to school, not just goofing off like a lot of folks. So, obviously, did that. And she she's you know joking about going through Texas A and M a little longer than some people. But it sounds like you were working while you were doing it. So, hey, what the heck? You're buying beer. I mean, I mean, gas, not beer. Yeah, really. both. Yeah. Well, and it was um, so. Yeah, I I kept working, and you know, I kept changing majors because I realized, you know, first of all, I, you know, I was going to be an engineer, but I, I realized that higher level math was just not one of my superpowers. And gosh, you know, you need that. You know, I, I get, I started getting into things like calculus and, you know, crazy trigonometry, you know, oh no, no, not, not my best superpower. And, um, you know, anyway, I, I, what I finally realized was I didn't have a solid affirmative goal. Like I, you know, I, when I went to school, it wasn't like, I'm absolutely going to be this and I'm 
firmly committed to it. So I'm going to go through school. My, I had a cousin, she and I went to A&M at the same time. She finished in three and a half years. She knew exactly what she wanted to do, what she wanted to be. I envied that. But the bottom line was I really just wanted to have options. Like, I think I'm one of those people that I, I'm, I don't like being locked into things. So I, I'm always looking for, okay, what's my option? But, uh, but I kept working and I kept getting promoted. And so finally I said, you know, I'm not really sure what I, I'm doing here at A&M, but let me, I see a career path here and I'm, I'm really enjoying this business thing. I started realizing that I enjoyed working with people. I enjoyed the pace of it. It was fun to, um, you know, really try and, you know, continue to, I love breaking records, you know, Oh, can we get more, can we get more sales in today? Can we get more cars through the drive through uh, that productivity piece? Um, it was, I, I found I enjoyed it. So I took a little break from school and uh, went through McDonald's training programs, became a manager and an area supervisor. And and I had a really great mentor at the time who I worked for. And I remember the day he promoted me to area supervisor. I was going to now have five stores. And he looked at me and he said, uh, so why did you come here? I'm like, come where? And he was like, here to Texas. I said, well, you know, to go to school. And he looked at me, he says, don't you think you should finish? And ah. I'm like, oh my God, you just promoted me to run five stores and <laughs> you want me to go back to school? He, And he said, well, now you have the flexibility to do it and you should. And you, you know, you, so I appreciate that, you know, here was somebody who saw something in me and he was also, advice. yeah, gave me great advice, gave me the opportunity to do that. And, uh, and basically told me he was committed to helping me get that done. And so at that point, I was very clear that business made sense. And I went back and finished my business degree at A&M. There's such a common thread in all the podcasts that we've done. Yeah. And, you know, entrepreneurs are very independent and, and uh, they don't like being told what to do. But every last one of them had a mentor or somebody in their life who just gave them a little swat in, in a little bit of a direction. And I just love those stories. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it, because we're all hard headed and we want to go a certain direction. But uh, you're right, a common theme that I think a lot of people need to have is you got to be open to taking in criticism, you got to be open to taking advice and finding somebody that really resonates with you. It's been big. How many times have we heard, you know, I didn't think I was going to stay in McDonald's for 20 years, and lo and behold, you did. Yeah. Uh, you know, how many times have we heard, you know, I had no idea what this business is about, but the guy invited me to go on the journey and I did it. And, yeah. and here I am today. You know, well, and I bet you that's a big thing for you in franchising because you have a lot of people like Chris and me, former corporate folks, corporate refugees. They're not used to being told what to do, and now they have to follow a model. And yeah. uh, and the thing that probably holds the ones back who aren't succeeding the most is the fact that they just can't take advice from other people who maybe know a little bit better about this particular situation. You know, I think that is, I mean, we see that all the time. You know, you buy into a franchise to save yourself time, right? You know, you're saying, here's the experience, here's the model, here's the, here are the systems and processes. And yet, you know, you find yourself wanting to reinvent the wheel, right? You know, that independent streak. I understand it, you know, I, um, but it it is the piece that is most challenging for people. You know, the, you, you want to be an entrepreneur, but yet you want you know, hey, I, I want to get there on a faster path. And, uh, but yet I sometimes still have to make those mistakes. And we try to guide people through that as much as we can. So, so did you ever uh, aspire to be a, f a franchisee of McDonald's or were you a franchisee of McDonald's? I, I never was. I had a, one opportunity just as I was leaving McDonald's. Um, I was actually switching over. I got recruited to go to Sport Clips. Um, and uh, uh, an operator asked, actually, um, uh, realized I was leaving that you know, there was kind of a rule. You don't pirate, you can't poach, you know, from the corp or whatever, but um, asked me, you know, actually asked if I wanted to come in as partner, but I had already made a commitment to, uh, to somebody. And I, I, that's a, probably another piece of values. When I make a commitment, I follow through on it. I did end up being a business owner. And actually what was interesting is um, a, a friend of mine and I, we bought restaurants in Austin, Texas, where I lived for, uh, after I left McDonald's, I, I went to uh, move back to Texas and, um, um, we, uh, bought an independent restaurant and we expanded that into, uh, actually two locations, uh, just before the, uh, uh, great fall in 08, which was interesting. <laughs> um, but, I remember uh, that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, you but, uh, 
you know, I, it was actually there. Those were, you know, it was an independent restaurant. Uh, we thought mm-hmm. about even franchising it, but I really learned to appreciate what the value of franchising was when we, when I owned a non-franchised independent business. Um, and, you know, you have uh, no my, clout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I realized I had to do everything. We had to do everything ourselves. You know, yeah. I mean, things that would have been done by the franchise, you know, and you realize how much time that takes. And when you really want, you know, where's your time most valuably spent when you're an owner? You know, it's really growing your business. It's, you know, um, growing your team and getting, you know, getting more customers and, you know, putting a system in place to make sure that you can grow that business. But when you're bogged down in in little details that are, um, you know, it's just not high value time, you know, and that's, that's what I really appreciate. I realized, you know, often I'd say, gee, if we were part of a franchise, I wouldn't be redesigning my own menu or finding somebody to redesign my own menu. That would be done, you know? Um, But I will say that as a entrepreneurial person, it it was nice to have full control of things. How long Uh, did you guys do that? I had it for about five years. And so what kind of food did you, uh, what, what, what kind of concept? Well, we called, it was, a, it was an Italian uh, restaurant, so Italian based. And then people would ask, you know, what our, our influence was, you know, you're Northern Italian or Southern. And I'd always say a little Eastern. And they'd look at me, I said, East Austin, because our our uh, our number one selling item was a Chipotle chicken pizza, you know, or Chipotle chicken pasta, which are, you know, clearly are not traditional, but we had a lot of fun with it. So I'm getting really hungry. I mean, we started with McDonald's and now we're in what, Italian and pizza. What, and she stayed in the restaurant business this whole time. Did you actually get back in the, uh, did you ever have to go back in the uh, restaurant and start cooking in the, or did you have to do the front of the house? I mean, did you ever have to dive all the way in? There were, um, there were times Valentine's day was our busiest day of the year. Um, the, mm-hmm. our little restaurant in Austin was known as a first date. It was a Mecca for first dates because it was, a uh, romantic and a value. So everyone, I mean, we just got killed on Valentine's day because everyone was going back to Romeo's, you know, and, um, it was, uh, on that day, you talk about trying to figure out capacities, you know, then it's all hands on deck. So there were times where, yeah, every once in a while I'd, I'd jump back and, um, uh, run the expo or get out and talk to customers. I will say that probably one of the best things I did for, for my business was, um, play in a, uh, 40 team softball beer league. Um, you know, we, I, I Good always networking. tell, absolutely. You know, I, it's interesting as new owners come on board with fresh coat, uh, they'll often say something, make a joke like, well, I love to play golf. I guess I won't have time for that. I'm like, Oh no, you should, you should play in a league. Um, you know, that's, it's a, it's great networking back, back then. I, no, I actually I bought a franchise from her instead of the one I had. Right. I know. No. Cause she encourages play, play you to play more golf, play more golf. You would have said, Hey, I'm going to stay with these guys. And I like I'm them. assuming if you follow the processes and you use uh, your time wisely, you have time for golf. I like it. Yeah. yeah. But I like, but actually I like the other part better too. It's because, well, we golf as well, but of course we are in a beer uh, golfing, <laughs> league. Uh, but we're not really in a league. We just go drink it. So you were able to dr- drum up a big network and get people uh, excited mm-hmm. about. So you probably, did you have to do a lot of advertising when you had the, the concept in Austin? Um, we did not do a ton. Uh, we did a lot of uh, community service stuff. So we would, um, you know, if we had the opportunity to donate food to a cause, um, uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of restaurant owners wouldn't do that. I think they, I, I always say they step over $50 to pick up 50 cents a lot. Mm. You know, they're worried about cost. but I said, you know, the best, I mean, food is love, right. You know, and you know, if, if there was an opportunity for us to, you know, provide some food for a, you know, for a, a community service stuff or get out there and network, you know, again, being in, in, um, you know, softball leagues and, and golf leagues and, you know, going out in the community was one of the better things for us. Uh, we were blessed. Um, uh, the Austin Statesman paper wrote an article on us the first Thanksgiving, right? Uh, it was about probably just about 10 months after we bought the restaurant. They did a kind of a nice expose on us as new mm-hmm. owners of the restaurant because we had done some community service stuff. And uh, right after that, so we basically earned media. And uh, right after that, our sales jumped up about 30%. That's on solid. a re- and that's restaurants don't jump like that. And this was a restaurant that had already been open about 13 years and we'd had it for about a year. And so, I mean, um, jumped up 30 and stayed there mm-hmm. for, for 12 months. Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
You know, she, we, we talk a lot about networking on the podcast and, and obviously we're big fans of it. You actually brought up two different avenues that I never really thought of, but as you brought that up, I started thinking back, you're right. I had picked up in my social network. I have picked up a number of different opportunities, you know, yeah. wh whether it be that, but then you hit on the other part and that is uh, giving back to the community. When you talk to your franchisees today, talk about how, how you tell them to get involved in the community and network through that way. Well, we highly recommend, we have a program we call Fresh Coat Cares, which is uh, our name for, you know, saying, hey, you need to be good corporate citizens as well as, um, you know, just doing great quality work for your customers. And we encourage uh, new owners to start as with a project, um, finding a project in their community where they maybe paint a room, um, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's like giving the gift of paint, right? Uh, we, it's a great way to get employees uh, and, uh, you know, painters involved. You know, I, we find that everybody on the team loves something that's a give back. Uh, it's, um, and what part of the, part of the way we encourage it is we actually support it. So if somebody is doing a Fresh Coat Cares project, uh, we'll chip in money against the labor for them. So we'll match basically uh, what they're contributing back to the community. And uh, Sherwin-Williams will donate the paint for the project. So, um, you know, they basically pay um, for half the labor and and really usually none of the paint. So is that an idea you brought to Fresh Coat? Was that something they were doing that you brought from your restaurant experience? It was something it was interesting. When I got here, they had just started. Um, they, they, there was it was getting some traction. So I can't say I brought it, but I did recognize the power of it and I, I expanded it. And that was you know, I, I felt like it was something that we needed not just to have be random acts of kindness, but to be a corporate, um, you know, um, basically part of our value structure. All right. So let's go back to 2008. So you got hit by something that uh, it's really hard to recover from and that took you out in the restaurant business. So then what would you do? Oh, she froze on me. Well, she's back. Um. So, yeah. I'm back. You I thought she was. For a second. I, I thought she was really thinking hard about I your know. question. I, it was I asked like, my asked question. A good question. And she, and she paused, and I was like, "Oh, I've done it." I'm <laughs> I gonna, think I'm I. Actually... I think I got all of the question. You were asking what happened at 2008. Um, you know, it was, and then what? And um, you know, it was interesting. I had an opportunity to um, uh, when we we sold the restaurant, which was um, had an opportunity to do that, and I went. Um, I started, uh, was definitely wanting to, I love franchising and I, I never really had left franchising. Even the whole time we owned the restaurant, I worked full time for, um, other, um, companies. So it required us to have, again, I had to have good staff, good scaling in the restaurant. I mean, so I wasn't physically always running it, but, uh, I found myself right then, um, I uh, was, I would like to say I was underemployed for a moment. And so um, uh, I had, uh, I had exited from a <laughs> position and we sold the restaurant all of a sudden for the first time since I was maybe 15 years old, I literally didn't have a job. I didn't have a business. I didn't have a job for a few months uh, that lasted maybe three or four weeks. And one of my former franchise owners, uh, the, I had mentioned, um, I think you mentioned, I worked with a system called Enhanced Wood Renewal. I love the trades, by the way, which is why I'm here with Fresh Coat. But we did cabinet and floor refinishing. And my local owner, the local Austin owner, um, called me one day and he said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, you know, he goes, uh, I, he, he, um, my brother had been helping him uh, on his crew. And he said, uh, well, hey, uh, uh, you know. I don't know where your brother is. There's a long story to that. But I said, well, um, if you need some help, I'll come help you. Because like, seriously, I wasn't doing anything. I, I actually, as soon as I was underemployed, I actually volunteered with the first T. Um, you might be familiar with that organization. But I, I called, I said, see, so yeah, I'll come over and uh, help you with your project. Um, so we were refinishing some cabinets and sat down at lunch. And he said, well, you know, I'd, I'd love, man, I'd, I'd love to have you help me in my business. And I said, Oh yeah, sure. Why not? You know, so we worked out a deal and I helped him triple the size of his business in about three months, um, finding staff, by the way, I found a lot of that staff, uh, through our, um, at our, between my golf league and the, uh, softball league. So you say uh, that so matter of factly, but you triple a business in three months. Yeah. What doing, do you do? Doing what? Yeah. Right. I know that's the first thing I was like, do what? Well, so, so this was interesting. So we had leads. So a lot of times I see this businesses have leads. Um, we see this with our fresh coat businesses. Um, 
you know, Cecil had leads coming in. He, the only thing that was holding him back from tripling his business was capacity, right? So how fast can I, you know, how many quotes can I do? Um, how many crews do I have to get the work done and do it at a quality level, right? Uh, so we just had to get his organization, we had to de- build his organization into something that could handle three times the business and uh, do it profitably, obviously, right? So, uh, you know, we, you know, I started out by helping him do quotes. Um, and then I trained, we trained salespeople uh, to to do quotes for him. Uh, got him an administrative assistant to handle um, so that, you know, you weren't dropping the ball on customers, making sure there was good, clear communication, be- you know, for uh, the quotes, you know, somebody answering the phone, following up to make sure that, you know, hey, Mrs. Smith, uh, you know, Tara's on her way out there to do that quote, or, you know, are you still good to go? And, and, you know, and, and helping us improve the closing rate. Um, there were several pieces of it, but it was mainly, it's about capacity, right? You know, we got to have the ability to get the work done. <laughs> that is so lightning fast. Cause you went from refinishing a couple of cabinets and he's like, yeah, I'd like to have you help out my business to tripling the business in three months. So somewhere within the first week you had to have gone, uh, hey, Cecil, you need an administrative assistant. Hey, Cecil, we need to change, <laughs> you know, how we're doing our, uh, y- you know, um, yeah. you, you're you're making a ton of changes in a short amount of time. And he was good with it. Yeah. You know, it was interesting because he wanted a scaled business. It was just kind of getting there. Right. And sometimes you just need a leg up. You need a hand. Right. You need somebody that when you're in the weeds, when you're the owner and you're on the ladder or you're st- sitting there refinishing cabinets you don't have time you, you won't make the time to go do the things you need to do it, it seems overwhelming at the moment you know and he was part and, of a franchise system right, right. at the time yep. it was enhanced and so the franchise was not giving him the support or he just wasn't taking it or he wasn't or- taking it because i had before um how i knew cecil was i had been vice president of um of operations so i was the support this and this was a fascinating a uh, lesson for me having mm. I'd been on the franchise or side for a long time um at this point and it had been a while since I'd been on the franchisee side and for about a year I actually I spent some time with Cecil then I actually went out to LA and helped another fr- enhanced franchise owner grow his business and what I realized is even me knowing that I needed we needed the support from the from the franchise or we would forget to think about them you're so focused on the customers and you're so focused on your business as a franchise owner. Uh, you often don't turn, you know, I think about it. You, you, you don't think about asking for the support because you're an entrepreneur. Right. Right. And what the lesson I walked away with uh, and I took into the rest of my franchising career was how we have to, we have to smooth. We have to be very proactive as the franchise or to make sure that we're helping to provide that support not waiting for them to ask for help, right? And and so without being overbearing, so there's a fine line there, right? I don't want to be, I'm not trying it's to, it's tricky. I'm not here to shove something down your throat, but we have to be, uh, the way I look at it is we have to have proactive support. We have to be very proactive with our level of support to make sure that that we're always right, that we're on top of mind so they don't forget to use the support they're paying for which is part of what you're doing as a, when you are in part of a franchise, you know, and, and then trying to use tech. Now we're looking at how do we use technology to help them have more instant access to support, not just from us, but probably the most valuable piece of being a franchise uh, in a franchise system is the other owners, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're walking the same walk you are. And, you know, I think the, the thing that struck me when we owned the restaurants and, when I worked with Cecil is how lonely it is to be an owner because there's no one else on your team. That's the owner, right? You know, you, you know, the owner is always really alone. Um, and I think what, like when I go out to the PCA conference and, and spend time with, you know, a lot of painting contractors that are not, they're, they're independent owners. I think the reason they're drawn to that is because that gives them an opportunity to sit down with other owners who you know, and it's funny in the trades, I think people are very willing to share. I, I love going out and meeting with, um, you know, I, I love to sit down with people who've scaled, you know, good God, you know, uh, 16, $20 million painting businesses. And 
you know, I want to know how did you get there? You know, what what are your systems you're using now? And people are more than willing to share. And that's stuff that we take away and, and use to help build the systems that help our owners grow and scale. Yeah. But, you know, the beauty of a franchise system is that you have other owners that are, you know, they're, and we, we do things to facilitate that, to their communication. And I think technology, um, that's our kind of our theme for this year is really stepping up the game of how do we use technology to help them be able to talk to each other faster? Yeah. So it's the old yeah. adage of uh, you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself in franchising. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. that That's solid that you're doing that. How many uh, franchisees do you have in Fresh Coat right now? Uh, we've got about 175 locations right now. So yeah. And, and so has it been that size or has it been growing? It, we've been growing uh, steadily. Uh, I I think when I took over, I'm in my ninth year now, but we t- I took over, we probably had 75 or 80 active owners. Nice. It's such a competitive space. What what drew you to Fresh Coat and, and what is it that you're offering that's different from some of your franchised competition? You know, I, I, I'll tell you, for what drew me to Fresh Coat in the first place, just I love, well, love franchising and I love the scalability of the trades and, and painting. I love the, I love the trades business model. I also think that there's in painting, especially the opportunity to, um, you know, from a competitive standpoint, you know, to professionalize this trade for the consumer is, is huge. You know, there's so, it's such a fragmented, um, you know, really presence out there and, um, you know, I think our I think consumers are just crying for people who do what they say they're going to do, communicate, you know, show up on time. Uh, hey, we're going to, you know, and um, and do it and and bring you know, do quality work and stand behind it, right? You know, I mean, gee, it doesn't sound like it's that hard, but but what's awesome <laughs> is you know, but you know, it's, right. it's oh, it's I wish it was that easy. If it was that easy, everyone would do it, right? Right. Exactly so, right. Well, so I saw one thing on your website that I wanted to kind of point out because Chris is always talking about in his business, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's just respecting the sanctity of the owner's home. Yeah. And in, I saw that on your website, and I really don't see that in too many other business uh, about us pages. And I thought maybe that would be something you might want to talk about. Yeah. And w- well, when Fresh Coat, you know, you think about it, there's there's not a tremendous number of franchisors in the painting space, and and uh, the majority of them were really, I think, focused a lot on exterior painting, and we felt like um, there was an opportunity to really hone in on that. You know, the interior painting um, at that time we were an employee model, so you know, hey, we Mrs. Smith, we know who we're sending into your home, background checked, um, you know, trained painters. Uh, you know, making sure when you're, you know, when you're dealing with the interior of a home, you know, you got to, it's a little different level, you know, it's taking that extra care, you know, putting on the booties, um, you know, making sure she understands, you know, we understand that we're going to take care of your environment and that your kids and pets are safe around us, you know. Um, it's, um, you know, it's also about not invading people's home, getting things done quickly, right? You know, uh, I, you know, it, We've all had great, uh, I'm not so great contractor experiences where you feel like the contractor moved in with you, right? You know, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> not my company. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh. yeah. No, that's so, the toolbox. Know, so we have realized that, you know, look, if you can do, if you, if you understand productivity and you understand production rates, you also then have some reasonable certainty to tell, you know, the homeowner or Mrs. Smith, as we like to call her. Hey, you know, this is a project and we're going to be in your home for four days. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have three guys in your home for four days. We're going to start on this time and we're going to do our best level best to be finished by this. And, you know, with an interior project, pretty much nothing gets in your way. Exterior can be interesting. You know, we can't control the rain. You can't control other things. But when you really deal with an interior project, you can give some certainty to the homeowner to say, okay, you know, we have a, this is when we're going to show up and this is when we're going to end. And that's the problem I see a lot of times out in the contracting world is sometimes, you know, and one of the fears even I have of hiring somebody is like, when is this project going to end? You know, sometimes they don't. Um, Which brings me up to my, this is going to be my next uh, business that I start. I'm going to start another contracting company. It'll be done in three days. So three days from now, done contracting. Because yeah. it'll always be three days from today. Whether it's yeah. done or no. not, you're just three out of there in three days? <laughs> no, it's just, no, I'm three days from now. Or, or like, it's just like, you know, you get a free hamburger tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow never yeah. happens. Beer. 
Free beer but, tomorrow, right? You right. Know. You know, I think you, you hit on something that I, I actually have talked about quite a bit. And uh, I'm getting ready to go to a study that they did here in Atlanta that I, I get to be privy to because I'm a because uh, I well because I kind paid. of a big deal. Yeah, I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah. And so, but they're they're talking about this, and I can't wait to see what this study brings about. But it, what I found out about two years ago is that as tradesmen, we get away with a lot. We we can, you know, I've got a handyman remodeling company, and you know they'll they'll put up with a guy with the ratty jeans and maybe you know the torn shirt because they're like, well, you know, but he knows how to do this carpentry or. I'll give Tony a break because, you know, Tony looks like he knows what he's doing. Oh, Tony was running late because he had a flat tire. Poor thing. Right. Oh, Tony couldn't make it today because his battery went out. Well, you know, and and we all know that that's uh, BS the whole time, but it doesn't matter about that. What I'm finding, though, is that the experience, the customer experience is becoming more and more important where we're not going to get as many passes as we used to get. Yeah. And and that's why we have got to be on point. You've got to be more on time. We don't give two hour windows. You got to give half an hour windows. You can't say it's going to be three days when you know damn well it's going to be six days. And so you've got to be more about setting yeah. that expectation so you can exceed it. And that's I think that's going to be bigger and bigger for all of us in the home services space. I agree completely. You know, I think that, uh, you know, it, it goes back to even, you know, when I started with Fresh Coat, it's not even been a, you know, but nine years ago just having a website or having a web presence made you different, right? You know, you, ooh. Now, you know, ooh. well, you know what now just about everybody out there, any small company, they have a Google, my business, you know, they have something. So there's, you know, again, so every time that, um, you know, I think it's just, yeah, the bar is being raised all the time. And I, you know, I feel like we have to stay ahead of that curve and make sure that we're, you know, our owners are, you know, whether it's through technology or other components that we're just a step, a, a step ahead of, you know, even the average competition now can, you know, you can sign up and get, you know, you can get text alerts, you can get things to help you communicate with your customers that, you know, uh, you couldn't get 10 years ago. And, yeah. uh, you know, so we have to, we are constantly having to evolve, you know, and I think that's, uh, I think that's gonna be true in all of the home services and trades for sure. Yeah, the the ability to communicate, set expectations, and in, in the instant gratification society we're in now too, especially. Yeah. Because I, you know, I tell my guys is uh, here's the first secret of the customer. Uh, I put that in my book, by the way, Alan. Oh but, yeah, we, I, we haven't talked about your book. We haven't brought about that. Oh, let me bring that up. Thank you for bringing that up, Alan. Yeah. How many uh, books have you written, Tara? <laughs> <laughs> She's probably written eight. No. Yeah. <laughs> None. Yeah. Oh, shoo, thank God. I thought it was eight. I'm like, no, I didn't see that yes. in your bio. <laughs> it's really bad day but, for me, Tara, when uh, the guest and Chris have both written a book and I haven't because I tend to hear about it. But <laughs> but what I talk about is they have no expectations. So when you show up right. to paint the house, they think you're going to come in, not make one speck of dust, and you're going to be in and out of there in five minutes. Right. Uh, no, no, Mrs. Jones, back to your person. Uh, this Mrs. Jones, poor Mrs. Jones. I wonder if her first yeah. name is Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there's Karen Jones and then there's, you know, Amanda Smith. We, we prefer, you know, no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> I love that. So, so you work on that and you guys, you mentioned employee owned in the franchise model. How much can you train? I, I've, I've had another franchisee tell me, well, the franchisor is not allowed to train me. It's a rule that they can't. I'm like, really? You know, um, you gotta, actually, you gotta be careful of, of the whole management. Joint issue. employer. Uh, I yes. think this is the uh, term that's used. Um, we can train our franchise owners, um, all day long, and we can provide them the tools to, to train their employees. And we can do classes. We can conduct classes that they send their employees to, um, all day long. So good news is we can do that, uh, where we can't control and manage their, their staff, uh, or their schedules. That's what, what, that's when it starts to bridge that, um, um, and joint employer challenge. And there, there are some franchise uh, models out there where it's more of a, where the franchisor maybe is getting the leads and setting schedules. And that's a little bit more in the gray area and, and we're not in that model right now. So. Gotcha. So right. we talk a lot about specialization on this podcast and I noticed, you know, you kind of mentioned, uh, some of the painters focus on exteriors and you are doing interiors, but I also noticed you do commercial space, which is yeah. really a completely different vertical. Is that something that you've brought to increase market share or, you know, is that, is that a completely different animal that you have to train differently for? It, it, yes. Um, 
And, you know, we started, and I'll go back, we started with a, a focus on interior, but we also realized very quickly that, um, you know, our, our, we do exteriors for the, you know, with the same idea, you know, hey, we want that certainty, right? You know, here's, you know, Mrs. Jones, it's going to be this, this length of time. Um, as we continued to grow, we realized there was, um, there was a big need out there for um, really in the commercial space to have uh, mobilized, I guess, better, you know, painters across the country. G general contractors, I think, find it a little challenging when they have a big project. Maybe they're doing 150, you know, of some real re retail establishment across the country, right? You know, and all of a sudden, you know, they're having to find painters, you know, in 70 markets. And that's not necessarily a lot of fun. What's really fun is when they can call one company and say, hey, I need painters in all these markets. Well, guess what? Uh, as we continue to grow and and penetrate more markets, the fact is that we now had the ability to to say, yeah, you know what, we can we can do that. We can cover, you know, maybe if you we might be able to cover all those projects for you. So it's more of a corporate account coming from the franchise or pushed out to the franchisees as opposed to the other way around. That's that's one area. I mean, that's where our expansion has been. You know, we had franchise owners who realized very quickly they built relationships in their local market and realized they liked doing the commercial side of the business. Um, we saw the opportunity to really uh, create, like we said, you know, hey, we can leverage our size and it's a win win. You know, we you know, the contractors and property managers can have one point of contact and then we can use our network of highly qualified people to, you know, to help them uh, get that project done. But, um, you know, it did take training. Not everybody was familiar with the commercial space. It's a different, you know, obviously a little different cadence in terms of, you know, working, sometimes you're working with other trades. Sometimes it's different, you know, we're now we're talking about, you know, night work sometimes, you know, if you're talking about retail repaint, um, um, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a lot of things that are different. So what was nice though, is that we, when we really, um, decided to expand this section of our business was right at the beginning of the pandemic when we were sitting still for a minute. Um, so we looked around and said, well, uh, we don't know, this is a very uncertain moment. This would have been in, you know, March, April of 20, and we weren't, nobody was really sure what was going to happen. All I know is that if you're facing turbulence, the best thing you can do is put your foot on the accelerator pedal, you know, and figure out how to move forward, right? That's, uh, so that's the title of this podcast. All right. When you're facing <laughs> turbulence, you, you, you know, I tried that today, and that's why I hydroplane on the road. Uh, we had a huge rainstorm it's, today. It's it's so, a metaphor. Chris. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I was trying to get around this joker, and I didn't hit him. I just moved him off the road, and I'm kidding. Yeah. All right. When you hit turbulence, hit, hit the gas it, pedal. Hit the yeah. Done doing it. So, so we, we sat down and said, Hey, we got to, you know, let's, so we worked uh, very quickly to put together some training programs that we could do virtually with our franchise owners to help them with the commercial space. Uh, we had some opportunity. We had just developed some relationships actually, ironically, right as the pandemic hit and it turned out um, people Commercial didn't slow down. Guess what? If my employees aren't in my office, it's a okay. great time to do painting. <laughs> exactly. It's like everybody's at home working from home. Well, okay, well, we can clean. We actually even uh, toyed with and brought in the idea of uh, doing um, uh, uh, sanit you know, basically sanitizing, you know. Um, right. And uh, it didn't stick for the long run, but we did have some folks that, you know, at least during that period, we had offer it. Um, we had a, uh, we, worked with some of the cleaning companies and developed a process really quickly to understand. It was interesting, different space, but, you know, it was something to say, Hey, Mrs. Smith, we'll, and we'll sanitize your home, you know, after we leave so that, you know, uh, disinfect it. Um, so that if you're worried about, you know, the germs from the employee, that's, it's long past now, but, um, uh, it was an opportunity area. We, we, we explored a few things to during that period to see, make sure that we, you know, that we could keep growing. Um, so as it turned, as it turned out, it turned out to be a great year. We only had a couple of down months, and then it turned around into record months after that. But uh, so that obviously lesson learned on the pandemic there, and people have been asking me that same question. And so we're looking at the 2023, 24, getting into that, and you're seeing you know looming recession, maybe some more headwinds coming at us again. Yeah. What are you guys doing to counteract that? And and is that some of the focus you have as a franchisor yeah. helping? Absolutely. Um, 
you know, again, going with the theme, what do you do? You got to hit uh, another friend of mine said, you know, if you got a hill in front of you and you're driving the car, what are you going to, are you going to hit the brakes or are you going to hit the accelerator pedal? So, um, you know, we're, that's right. <laughs> so we, um, it was the things we're doing. We, first of all, uh, we are upping our spend uh, on uh, marketing. Um, just, you know, right now, it's, again, we're facing headwinds. We're working with our franchise owners um, to refocus. It's interesting because what happened was we came out of a period um, 21, you know, the end of 20 all the way into 21 in the first quarter of last year was unprecedented growth. I mean, just in terms of the the number of leads coming into the trades in general was just insane. Um, it was great. Awesome time to be in the trades, but at the same time, um, you know, most, I think you'll, even most of our tenured folks will say we got a little lazy, right? We didn't really have to work very hard to get those right. leads. Right. So, you know, some of the basic stuff that we know works, you know, uh, our networking, uh, getting out there and doing those uh, feet on the street things, uh, the um, local marketing, some of that suffered. So we're, we're just pushing the reset button uh, this spring. We're going to work. We're working with our owners to just say, hey, let's make sure we're putting our marketing plans in place. Uh, as a franchisor, we're going to double the spend that we're doing nationally to make sure that, you know, we're helping to, um, uh, you know, our franchise owners grow the business. We've, we're continuing to invest in that commercial side, especially that's our largest growth area last year was in commercial. And uh, we expect that that's going to continue into 23. I think, um, you know, when we see the headwinds in front of us, um, you know, I, I always believe that out of turbulence comes opportunity. I think that's the one thing I've always said, you know, when the, when the seas are calm, there's, you know, there's not as much opportunity when, when there is head, when there's headwind and there's turbulence, that's when there's really opportunity to have extraordinary growth in a business, but you gotta be, you know, you gotta be proactive in it. Um, yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, not to say that I was doing it, but but I am doing the same thing. I I uh, had three estimators who uh, didn't have to do any networking at all because we kept feeding them leads. And I'm like, boys, it's time to get out there. Um, so yeah. every one of them is going to a BNI meeting mm -hmm. next week uh, to yep. get in the weekly networking and do that. Um, I'm doubling down on radio, going out uh, and doing some uh, TV spots. So yeah, I think I think that's what we've got to do in 23. Yeah. Is, Hit that gas pedal, big boy. I, I had one of my old mentors he, who said to me once, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. And I had to think about it. I'm like, what the <laughs> heck does that mean? I just moved to the South. But, yeah. you know, like you said, it was really easy to do business. You didn't have to do yeah. anything. You're a hog. You're going to get slaughtered if you stay a hog. But if you're a yeah. pig and you're greedy. Mm -hmm. Well, Tara, I've enjoyed our time together. We're coming to the end. Um, but I can't let you go without plugging a little bit. Like we've been talking about fresh coat painters. How can everybody find out either one, if they want to buy into this franchise or, Hey, if I got a fresh coat painter in my area, where do I go find them? Okay. So obviously, um, you know, searching fresh coat on the uh, internet. So you, our website is, um, you know, freshcoatpainters.com or freshcoatfranchising.com are the, are the two websites. Uh, if you've, go to, if you're interested in a franchise, definitely I would suggest uh, go there, uh, ask for some information. One of our uh, recruiters will give you a call and, and talk you through that. We're, we're not here to sell franchises, by the way, it's got to be a good fit, but if you want information, that's the best way to get it. And, um, you know, again, we've got, you know, over 170 locations out there. Uh, definitely would love to have you uh, let us give you a quote and, uh, if you've got a painting project uh, and if you're in on the commercial side and have big projects out there, uh, we'll, we'll provide one stop shopping for you. So I've got a whole team that, you know, project managers um, and uh, in fact, I've got a vice president does nothing but uh, manages the commercial side of the business for us. So nice. So it sounds like a franchise that actually has a lot of support. It sure does, right? Yeah. I mean, how many times have you heard about the ones who don't? No. You know, we're actually I got a good it's friend a, right it's now. It's a shell. Yeah. Yeah. Totally getting scammed by the, the group he's with. So go yeah. out there and check them out, Fresh Coat Painters. Somebody is doing it right. Get involved in the community. Go check them out. But I can't let you go, Tara, without asking our final three questions. And as I heard on a different podcast, everybody waits for those final, his final five questions. I'm well, like, he has I five. He had five. Yeah. And he was <laughs> rapid firing me too, bro. I mean, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I was ready. All right. But I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with my three. So, yeah. um, so first uh, question I have, which I just forgot what I was going to ask, but what is your favorite feature of your home? My favorite feature in my home is the hidden room. Whoa. It's like a panic room. Yeah. Or uh, <laughs> okay. So I bought this house two years ago. 
And there was there. Well, I, I was I had to do. I mean, I had to do a quick tour. I was late for my my appointment, and I saw this um, trap door in the master closet. And I thought, oh, it's a floor safe. That's awesome. You know, and anyway, I moved in, didn't think about it. And there was a, the previous owner had left a key on a bulletin board and said key to the trap door in the master ba- bedroom. And um, anyway, I, I can't believe this. I didn't open it. And my dad came to visit and he's like, what is this? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a floor safe. He said, well, did you open it? And I'm like, no. So don't you think you should? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. Well, anyway, so imagine my surprise. I, get the key, I open it and I look and there's a very dark, there's a ladder going down (laughs) and a dark space. And I should have noticed that the garage under my bedroom was, you know, 10 feet shorter than the rest of the house and that there was a extra room. I said, talk about a bonus room. Um, I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do with it yet, but I have this uh, room that, you know, I can access through a ladder in the, uh, in the I think floor we have of to my retire closet. the question. That one is probably <laughs> the best answer I've ever heard. I've yeah. heard, you know, outdoor living, you know, my office. I was waiting for yeah. you to say, I opened the trap door and there was a little light down there and I heard a record player playing or something. <laughs> no. lost. Well, I, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I mean, I, it was I'm thinking. creepy. I mean, for the moment, it was pitch black and I'm like, I'm, I had to get Good a flashlight. Your dad was there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, dad. I'm glad my dad was there. And I'm like, oh yeah. my goodness. You said, you sent him down there first. Hey dad, go down there and check it out. Let me know. Yeah, Go on. check that out. You know, hey, it's like... you're older. I got more to live for. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> did I say that? on the did. I did. All right. Yeah. All right. Sometimes you should. Number two, me. you've been in the restaurant business. You've done a lot of stuff. You've obviously been f- customer facing. You've been out there. What is your biggest customer service pet peeve? Wow. Um, well, if you it depends on the space, but in restaurants, I will tell you my biggest customer service pet peeve is closing time. Like, you know, when we owned a restaurant, we sat. If you have a, a, a hours of operation, you seat until that time and yes. you close when you're done. Yes. But but in in the world of restaurants, I I absolutely hate when people like okay they supposedly close at eight. Well, that means we can't seat you after seven thirty because we have to close at eight. I'm like. I don't think that's the way it should work. So that's one of my biggest customer service pet peeves outside of the trades. There you go. Yep. Set an expectation and sit up to it. And how many times we we literally uh, showed up Cinco de Mayo, went to a, a Mexican restaurant, 730, and they closed at 8. And they said, sorry, we're not seating anymore. We're closing at 8. Really, but. Yeah. But but you're open. Or if they right. see you, the next what, thing you know, you they got the lice all out and they're putting chairs up on yeah. tables. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. a great one. Hey, yes, yeah. this is great. Solid answer. All right. Now, here's one of my favorite ones. She's two for two. All right, here we go. Let's see if she can do it three for three, and then we'll find out what she wins, Don Pardo. <laughs> oh, that's a long story. I am old. All right. What is a uh, DIY nightmare story? Ooh, DIY nightmare story. Personal or somebody else's? <laughs> oh, it's got to be yours. Okay. It's, it's more fun when it's yours. Yeah. Oh. And we, and we like fire. And explosions. And explosions. Fires. And fire. Ooh, that's a good one. Um. Wow. You know, I learned at an early age that I didn't like doing things myself, uh, but uh, I think my biggest DIY um, uh, nightmare story was when I was still in college, I thought I needed to be an auto mechanic. And uh, I mean, I bought tools and I still have them, by the way. People are like, why do you have all these tools? I'm Mm -hmm. like, well, because I wanted to save uh, $25, well, probably back then, $15 changing my oil. So I have, I still have... um, ramps i've got one of those rolling um <laughs> toolboxes i mean you know so you know really from i don't i never never managed to destroy my car doing this so it would have really been a nightmare story but you know if you really think about it i mean i that's the nightmare it's the nightmare of realizing you know to really do things right how many tools do you have to buy how many you know you, you um, hit on one. I had the, uh, you remember the black pan you'd put underneath the car oh, to yeah. drain the oil into? Yeah. I must have kept that sucker for like 10 years, never changing my oil ever again, because I said, well, I got to, because I grew up in the Midwest and I have to do the same thing. I've always got to change my oil and I stopped doing it. And you started realizing that you can go get your oil changed for, you know, 20 bucks right. or you can go spend 65 bucks and uh, three trips and a Saturday morning draining your own oil. So I love that one. That's a great one because sometimes we attack things and we just got to say, whoa, stop. And I tell people that all the time. Pennywise, how foolish is that where that came from? Absolutely. That is so. Or, or, hey, you can take five trips to Home Depot to do your project, or you can call us and we'll just take care of it and you can go off and go off. So it's up to you. Tara, I've enjoyed our time together and we have enjoyed our time learning a little bit more about what it takes to run a great franchise. Thank you so much for coming on. 
Oh, I thank you for having me and uh, look forward to maybe getting the chance to meet you in person one day. So yeah, I'm maybe on the golf course. That's maybe. right. All right. I might know one. All right. All right. <laughs> Small business Sounds safari. Good. Be good. Keep going up that mountaintop. Make it happen. 2023 is your time to shine. Make it go. We're out of here. Cheers. Cheers.